All right, so I've got to start over. Um, yeah, thank you, Nahida. I, I will never remember. So once I start thinking about the lecture, it's sort of all over. So um, I did talk about, I will post a, I will put a classwork post for the Hecuba. And if you've already done 10 posts or you've done nine and you'd rather do Play-Doh, you don't have to do it. If you want, if one of your posts was a lot lower than the others and you want that one to get knocked out, this a better one in, that's all up to you at this point. You just have to have 10. I will divide the number by 10. Um, so, Let's see, your research papers. I've only met with four or five students. I will make office hours. It has to be either eight in the morning, eight to 12 in the morning, 12 at night, Bangladesh time, or um, eight to 12 at night, Bangladesh time. Those are the hours that are possible. <laughs> Don't go with one, two, three, four, somewhere in there. That would be the middle of the night for me. So um, let's see. Then um, I don't want you to, to get way behind. Uh, a lot of you are way behind. I don't know what I can do about it. Um, I'll do whatever I can. If you just, the, another thing, once you get so far behind, you sort of need someone to talk to to remind you of what was going on because we're thinking about the material, right? We're not just memorizing the material. It's not just, you know, short answer. It's not multiple choice. It's not right or wrong. So if you want to kick in that reflective capacity, you might find other people in the class to just have a conversation with online to kick in, you know, what did you think? What are you going to write? Or you can always meet with me just to get you back in the groove of thinking about it. So all of that's good. Um, all right. So today, oh, OK, Rossi. Um, Professor, I have a question regarding the presentation. A few weeks ago, I heard you mention something about the presentation regarding the final paper in Hecuba. Is that still happening or do we just need to write the final paper for Hecuba? Okay, so, um, all right. On your research papers, there will be a day, a class day when you present about your research papers. And then on your final papers, um, I don't, I'm not quite sure I have a class day for you to present the calendar. I put the calendar up there, but you don't have to, only part of it is on Hecuba, okay? At least 50% of your final paper. Your final paper is what you, what, what did you really get from this class the most? that you're going to take with you. But 50% of it has to be Hecuba or Plato because I haven't made you post on it. Is that OK, Rossi? Does that make sense? Hey, yes, Professor. And for the final paper, um, when you send in like sample papers from previous semesters, like for the research paper? Like I did for the research paper? Um, yeah, yes. if I can, I'm not quite sure. I will, if I can find some, I definitely will. And um, I'll write that down too. Um, because that was, I think I, I know that I made them write papers about Hecuba and I made them do more work so far. So, I'm, I probably made them write a final too, but I'll check that out for sure. And I'll, I've jotted a note for me. So anybody else have a question? Um, so the main theme today is a theme that all of you should have thought about by now, 
maybe you think a lot about it, but if you haven't, you need to. <laughs> and so this is about how Athens was structured to develop that critical thinking. And we've talked about that a lot, right? The mythology is designed to develop critical thinking. The tragedies are designed to develop critical thinking. The Oracle at Delphi is designed and it's all designed to help you become a good citizen. So you can spot corruption in a leader or you can spot a good leader and you know the difference. So it doesn't matter if you actually have the power, you're a good citizen if you know how to identify who's a good leader and who's not. Um, then when you do get a chance to vote, which the um, Ecclesia of Citizens in Homer, they got to vote, but still Agamemnon made the final decision or Priam made the final decision. Now in Athens, they voted and the majority rule was the final decision. So that's a, a move toward more democracy. Now in this process of globalization, the theory was during the, um, after the wall fell and as globalization happened, the idea was that there would be more and more people going into the middle class. There would be more and more education. More and more people would be engaged citizens and gradually they would get more and more power over their lives, like the local community, the national community, and the, the nation states would work together on climate change. They would work together on money laundering. They would work together. There's just a lot of problems that are international problems, international crime, um, drug cartels. So they require countries to work together. So Athens, the story of Athens is the story of a society where they cultivated the culture to develop this kind of critical thinking, citizen engagement. Now, um, the story that I'll tell you is how Athens corrupted their city. The Athenians, took the notion of freedom, like we were talking about in Hecuba, and they used it as a tool for their own power. Or in Hecuba's case, she had freedom, she took revenge. Agamemnon really shouldn't have done that, but he just used his power in the name of freedom. Um, so people in Athens took their ability to participate in public life, and they just use it to maximize their own pleasures or to get as rich as possible or as powerful as possible or as popular as possible. So even if you were a comedian, um, you could use comedy to educate people, but you could also use it just to distract people or to just be popular. And so if it meant demonizing some outsider, if it meant corrupting judgment, but if it gave you power or status or money, you would do it. So that's Fox News, right? The family at Fox, the Murdoch family, they do not believe a lot of that stuff. Uh, one of the Murdoch boys, Lakin, is moving to Australia. <laughs> which is one of the most lockdown oriented countries, but it's okay with him. If the people on Fox complain about any sort of masks or anything, as long as it makes money, they don't care. So that's what happened in Athens is that people use the power of rhetoric to manipulate other people and the city eventually lost its democracy. So what I want you to think about is this, this problem of globalization also. It's, it's getting, you know, people are questioning it. Like 
people can get into the middle class to a certain limit and now it's stopped. Or people have gotten there, but it's by exploiting natural resources and now we have to deal with climate change. So how are we gonna get people in the middle class without exploiting natural resources and making climate change worse? There's more and more concentrations of wealth. There's more and more um, uh, money laundering and underground money uh, systems that are being revealed in the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers. And so it's looking like globalization is not leading to democracy. It's leading to the rule of the rich and international oligarchy. And so, um, so what I want to ask each of you, and, and again, you know, I hope, you know, I hope you've thought about it and you get a chance to get on your soapbox. But Athens lost their democracy in 30 years. Plato uh, grew up and they had just won a war. They were the most powerful city state. It only took 30 years for them to abuse their power, to destabilize their society, and to elect a dictator. So they elected one of, Plato, one of Plato's uncles wrote the Constitution of Athens. He was like the founding father of Athenian democracy. Another one of his uncles was the one who ran for president. He said, if you vote for me, I'll take us back to traditional Athenian values when children obeyed their parents and everybody believed in the city's gods and everybody was patriotic and they did what they were told by the military and the president, nobody questioned. So I'll bring you back to the good old days. And they elected him and he was a dictator. He killed off his political enemies. He, killed, he kicked out all the foreigners or killed them. And he reigned for nine months, a reign of terror. That was Plato's uncle. <laughs> and then he got replaced again. And then, you know, his friend Socrates got killed. But the main point is just, I want you to compare your countries some of your countries are monarchies. Some of them are aristocracies where there's a couple families that basically uh, take over ruling uh, and being ruled. And some of them are democracies where people elect their president or their leader. Some of them appear to be democracies, but it's actually just a few families that run everything. Even Greece has that. There's three main families that pretty much control who the candidates are. Um, in the United States, there's some billionaires, fossil fuel billionaires that control who the Republican candidates are. Um, so there's how whatever it appears to be, and then there's what really is. And then how do you think moving forward, what does your society need to do to become more stable, have a bigger middle class, and um, get more democratic, more citizen engagement in public affairs. Citizens are informed about things. And what does your country have to be particularly careful about? Because things could fall apart pretty quickly. Now, all of you in Afghanistan are Prob I can't believe you aren't thinking about this because the US has just said they're gonna leave by September 11th and NATO has said they're gonna leave. So I'm wondering what my students from Afghanistan are thinking. Uh, but I did wanna start out while you're thinking about that. Um, uh, let's see, you can't raise your hands, but I hope you've heard about the George Floyd case and the George Floyd verdict. Um, so I'll just explain it if you haven't. He was a black guy who um, a police officer uh, handcuffed him, set him down on the ground, 
all he did was uh, uh, pass a $20 confederate, uh, what, fake uh, counterfeit bill, and he got stopped. He got, uh, you know, roughed about, got handcuffed behind his back, lying on the street, and Mr. Chauvin put his knee on his neck for nine minutes and 26 seconds. So there was a trial. And in our country, there are there's a huge problem with police officers, uh, mostly white, uh, killing, um, killing black people and not paying any price, okay? Because they have what's called qualified immunity. If you thought you were being threatened, if you thought it was reasonable punishment, uh, you can get off because I've read about this and I've read the cases in the past. But today the verdict came out that he's guilty on all three charges. And then there'll be a sentencing to see how there's maximum sentencing, minimum sentencing. So that will come out in a few days. But so in my country, we have to deal with racism. It's a problem because we had slavery. And so we still have systemic racism where African-Americans haven't been able to buy houses that build equity. And again, I'm not quite sure uh, what you all know about all of this. I don't, I don't, I don't wanna treat you like your countries are more backward than they are. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to assume, oh, everybody's got this. So I'll, I'll just tell you that when you have a house in a good neighborhood, you might pay $800 a month in your mortgage, but $200, $300 of that is goes to the house and the other part goes to the bank. At the beginning, the bigger part goes to the bank and gradually it's the house. And by the end, you have a whole lot of money uh, saved in your house. So that's called equity in the house. And that's your money. You can take money out of it. So that's how my kids got to college was that we had, my parents had some equity in a house. They let us take over the mortgage. They let us have that equity. We put it into some investments in the stock market when the stock market was going up and that was for the kids education so that's how we paid for their college so african americans have never been able usually they have to rent they can't buy houses if they buy houses the values of the house are low because every time a black, an african american tries to move into a neighborhood where there would be a house that builds equity, white people leave. And so then the value of the houses goes down so they can't build equity. And so that's been a huge problem, huge problem. And then education. So the money for the schools is based on the taxes you pay on your house. And if your house is not worth much, you pay fewer taxes. Well, then your schools aren't any good. So every time an African American is trying to get out of the ghetto, which again was formed because of racism, they try to go to the suburbs. So there was another killing by a police officer in Brooklyn Park. That's what's called a first ring suburb. So the ghetto was in northern North Minneapolis. I lived there for 17 years. And then those people tried to, you know, build up some savings to, to put a down payment on a house in the suburbs. Well, as soon as some black people moved to Brooklyn Park, then the real estate agents set, told white people, oh, the value of your house is going to go down. Sell your house, get out, get out before it goes down. So they had white flight. So they sold their house to the real estate people for less, substantially less than it was worth. And they moved. And then the black people moved in because these were the houses they could afford. And then the value went down. And then the tax base for the schools went down. So the quality of the schools goes down. 
And in our country, you have to pay for going to a good college. Even a state college costs some money, thousands of dollars. Um, so our country has a lot of, it's expensive to have children in our country because the capitalist system expects parents to work hard and then to pay for their kids' college or to pay for all this, for transportation. Everybody has to have a car. So um, black people have just gotten uh, systemic racism. So, and then the police, so the police officers, again, they're put in a really tough position because rich folk just walk away and don't pay taxes. So the police officers have to deal with these lousy environments, right? And they're supposed to police after so much else has gone on to make people, to pit people against each other. They're afraid of each other. They're, they're just on the edge of poverty all the time. So then you have this animosity and you have a history like that. So in Brooklyn Park, that was a first ring suburb with mostly black people. The housing values went down, the quality of schools went down, but you still had white police officers. I don't, I'm sure not all of them were because it's getting better, but so that's another problem. Um, so I am moving back to Minnesota in a few, in a month or three weeks or something. Um, and so, uh, you know, he was, George Floyd was, uh, the police officer was found guilty. Um, and so there's a big relief. My son, the state had told my son, first of all, they were all supposed to open up their schools. So he opened up on Monday but then they said, because of the George Floyd verdict on Monday, they told them, well, you're going to have to close down on Wednesday because of the verdict. Now, it's very possible that the governor said, OK, the verdict is guilty. We're not going to have race riots. And so you can stay open. Um, I really want to get a hold of my son. or I'm going to email him after this. I don't like to, to bother him because I feel like he knows that I would like to know. But if I nag him, it's like one more thing. Um, he doesn't need to have me, you know, interfere and have my own opinions because I'm opinionated. And I, but after COVID, I've tried to learn not to be so much so. But, but, so I want you to think about that delicate balance, like how do you nurture a democracy? And what is it in your country? What's the balance? And Rossi just had a really good story. She was just telling me, which is exactly um, related to all, all these issues. Do you want to tell the story, Rossi? Um, sure, Professor. So recently, um, oh wait, regarding the Guardian one, Professor. Um, so last night I ran upon an article by The Guardian. They, because right now the situation of COVID-19 in my country is really bad. We the Guardian like actually, I, does everybody know The Guardian is published in, in England, Manchester? Yes. You think everybody knows that? I'm I not don't sure, know. but like... Um, okay, go ahead. So, um, since in my country right now, we reach over 600 cases a day, and that might not seem a lot to some countries, but considering the fact that we never go beyond 10 cases a day, after the community spread where it reached 600 cases a day, uh, and now we are up to 5,000 cases in total and over 40 deaths, the government decided to put a lockdown in the capital city and certain parts of the provinces that have their spread and so last night the guardian published an article saying that the lockdown was a strategic move by cambodian government to show that it's uh, approaching a total dictatorship and i just find this absurd and bullshit because their country also has lockdown because of covid19 and they're not mentioning anything related to like politically about that, but they pointed out 
on Cambodia that this is a political move, but if the government do not take any actions, then the spread will just continue and there are already thousands of people affected and even me living in the countryside i'm already affected by the rise the insane rise in price it's like 200 percent rise and people are losing their jobs so they couldn't afford to buy the necessities that they need and so i feel like because of this article and it's from the guardian it's a news article or like from a pay uh, from a news media that is well respected in Cambodia, a lot of reckless people will act negatively towards the news. And then I feel like it would just cause more chaos in a time when we need people to stay at home. And so like, I, I don't know, but once people started to see the news, then they'll start having riots and then demanding the government to like take down, take out the lockdown. And then people will just go to the normal lives and then the cases will just continue and then it will reach a point that it's out of hand and then we cannot control the case and then it will just become the next Venezuela or the next Italy. Okay, so the point that the way that fits in with the lecture for today, right, is the way that rhetoric can be used right, to destabilize a society, okay? To me, this might be a case of tragic good intentions, okay? So the guardian writer might have good intentions, but they're making a bad choice. Does that make sense, Rossi? I feel like um, they are just, uh, they are trying to like give Cambodians like, like a bug so that we keep, like they keep us on the radar of like, knowing what our government are doing, but then I feel like it's at a wrong timing for, in a way, right. because right, right now, we don't want riots to be happening, but when they post it at that time, it's just like kind of triggering that, you know? So, right, yeah. very good. I hope other people understand this. This isn't like a Fox News, you know, throwing, mm. you know, deliberately screwing things up. The Manchester Guardian, Let's assume that they have good intentions, right, Rossi? Mm -hmm. It's just that they're making a bad judgment. Yes. Let's assume that they are in favor of cultivating democracy, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. the British, they, especially The Guardian, it's a left-wing uh, newspaper. They want to cultivate. So they want to be sort of the watchdog to make sure, you know, if any sort of authoritarianism rises in the developing world, they're going to be the first to report it, right? But you're yeah. saying they're wrong. Like, they're just going to trigger this other reaction unnecessarily, right? They've misjudged the situation. They need to understand it from a Cambodian's point of view better, okay? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. And I feel like um, the, the timing of it was just kind of like, that's also kind of what happened during the Khmer Rouge. It's them using like a piece of information to falsify the situation. And then it just triggers people who are already like in the suffering zone. And so right now, a lot of people are just trying to find a way out to survive, to say the least. And so with this piece of news then it's just kind of like they use it as like a reason to act on something and i just don't want it to go in that direction i just want people to read it understand it and like consider about it but not act like quickly about it like at least discuss it with someone to like share your ideas and then they may tell you like maybe they have a different perspective something like that yeah. Good. And there, I mean, the other thing that's interesting is that you can get the same result, which is a reaction by the citizens that destabilizes and then a authoritarian ruler has to come in with two different kinds of political actors, right? So the Khmer Rouge wanted to be authoritarian, right? And so they would do it with this view of creating uh, instability in order to come in and control, 
right? Whereas the guardian thinks that they're doing it to prevent, right, the authoritarian. But you're saying actually they're going to have the same <laughs> result as the Khmer Rouge, which is they're going to destabilize if we don't have a lockdown. And then the government is going to come in. Does that make sense? And that is a very classic case of tragedy. And that's where I think an education in tragedy helps you understand this stuff that goes on in the news. Does that make sense? I hope the rest of you, I hope this is making sense because it, life is complicated, but there are patterns in the midst of that complexity. And so many news articles oversimplify, right? Even smart people oversimplify. And I think it's partly because they don't get an education in tragedy. They don't see the world that way. They don't sort of look for where are the tragic good intentions in this. They, you know, they want it to be simpler. And it's just not. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Rupia, did you have anything? Do you have some example in your country of this constant juggling or this corruption? Okay, so you can also type in, you know, if you don't have anything. Um, Espina, do you have something? All right, so I, I'm sure that when you're sitting around at home, people talk about politics. I can't imagine people don't talk about it. The question is, how well do they talk about it, right? How much do they know, whatever. So, Jereen, do you have something? I'll pass, Professor. Okay, uh, Madeline? No, I don't have anything to say. Okay, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you there? Or Sam, are you there? Sorry, internet was being slow. I don't really have anything. Oh, okay. So you don't have like, Madeline, you don't have any opinions about George Floyd? Um, I'm not like a very political person. And I just like, yes, I like understand what's going on. Like I read the news and stuff like that, but I usually just kind of, I don't really speak it. So. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe you could use this as a, a learning, right? So you didn't think about it and now you start thinking about it. I, there's always a certain point at which somebody realizes that political things affect them. Um, so hopefully, you know, this would be a watershed for Americans to start paying attention to systemic racism, to how we're going to move forward. Um, and, you know, getting over the old whatever old stereotypes or prejudices or whatever, just figure out a way forward. Um, so Elizabeth, you have nothing? You didn't think about the George Floyd case? I mean, when I say I don't have anything to say, I mean, I don't have anything to add. Like I watched the, the verdict delivered live today, but I mean, I don't, justice was served, I guess. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a whole lot else to add. There's. I don't feel like there needs to be a whole lot else said other than I'm glad that he got what was coming. Um, what about Sam? I basically feel the same way. We were all together when we watched the verdict and stuff. And so we all kind of um, feel the same way about it. I mean, justice was served for sure. Um, and I saw that Biden and Kamala both made a comment about how they felt like this was a good step in the right direction for the country. So, and I, I liked their comments, so. Okay. 
All right. So, um, yeah, if you, um, well, in your research papers, if you're interested in, you know, the legal system, if you want to do, I mean, you're, you know, our emphasis is on gender issues, but if you want to link gender and race um, and just oppression in general, um, if you want to take the particular moment to take advantage of that, that's fine. Um, News Rot, do you have something? Okay, Jana Tool. Yes, Professor. Do you have something? Uh, professor, uh, not now. Okay, Nahida. Uh, no, Professor. Margia. No, Professor. DT, do you have something? DT? Okay. Untari, do you have something? Okay, so here's Rupia. Um, all right, so the government is in uh, Rupia. She's in that village in the countryside. The government announced the lockdown everywhere and we're suffering. What country are you in, Rupia? I'm sorry. Uh, Bangladesh, okay. So the government just announced a lockdown in Bangladesh, okay. Uh, again, I probably should know that, but all right. So, so now, right, you must be debating things like, um, is this the best decision to make, right? Um, Untari, do you have something? No, Professor. Okay. Um, Al, do you have something? I have something for George Floyd and I have something for Athens. Would you like me to do George Floyd first and then we'll go to Athens later? You can do both, okay. it's fine. Um, so as far as the George Floyd thing, uh, I'm glad that you know, it went to trial and, you know, we had a jury sit and talk about it instead of it getting swept under the rug, which a lot of the times um, instances of police violence really do get kind of forgotten or hidden away. Um, I mean, we still have the whole thing with Breonna Taylor where nothing's happened um, judicially, even though that, that's been seen as like a huge failing on the police. So seeing accountability on the, on the end of the police is, is nice to see. Because even though <clears throat> it may be that George Floyd was a criminal or he was in possession of drugs or he did whatever, no one deserves to get killed over a fake $20 bill, you know? And uh, I think it's it's good that we're show well, at least um, they're showing over there that they're not going to allow that to continue. Um, and I think in the future, it should be a lot easier to uh, deliver that accountability to police. Because I mean, um, a big oversight that I've seen personally is that there's no certification for police officers that they can lose. So if you're a medical professional and you're a doctor and you perform malpractice and someone gets hurt because of your actions, you can lose your license and you lose your ability to practice. But as a law enforcement um, professional, because of the strength of police unions, um, that certification doesn't exist. So it's very hard to hold someone accountable when there's such a strong union and there's no other recompense. So I think um, formalizing that a little bit more, and I mean, it is a difficult job to do because you get put in very difficult situations, but at the same time, we should be holding these people to a very high standard because it's an important job that they're doing and it, it can't be done half-assed. It has to be done well, it has to be done faithfully to the people. And then as far as uh, Athens goes, um, I think a big success of Athens is that for the most part, the governed and um, the governing were the same people. So people, I mean, it was mostly 
men of military service or landowners and men, but the same people that were making the rules, those rules were applied to them. And if you see a lot of the time in today's governments that it seems that if you have a certain amount of uh, money or status, the rules no longer apply to you. So there's that disconnect where legislators are making laws that won't affect them, that they don't care about, that they have no, um, they have no attachment to them. They don't care one way or the other because at the end of the day, it doesn't affect them. But when you're participating in the government in Athens, your decisions are affecting you. What you're saying is affecting you. And there's also such a big um, push socially on being politically active. Like I feel like in today's society, um, it's very big to say politics. I don't talk politics at all. Um, I don't wanna talk about it with other people. I don't even talk about it with my family. My political conscience is, is my own. And I kind of keep that hidden. And I understand why people are like that because it is a very personal thing. But I think uh, the way that Athens uh, kind of designed itself to make it where everyone was involved in politics and everyone was talking about politics, I think that's very smart to do because it, it makes it easier to find those corrupt leaders when everyone's looking. You know, and right now in today's society, I feel like not everyone is looking. Okay. Um, Bondona. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you have some example from your country of um, the relation between the rulers and the ruled? Uh, ma'am, like, um, it's very like, uh, like, it's like Corona, like in our country, the Corona is uh, rapidly rising uh, for the first uh, one week. And the cases are quite high, uh, more than like three lakhs. Uh, it have crossed within uh, two or three days. So like it happened uh, for the last one month, there was an election uh, duty going on. So there was an election held and like the political leader were roaming from one place to another with a huge people. Uh, and it came that that time there was no Corona. And means like there was no COVID cases anywhere because that was the, uh, I mean to say that was uh, the uh, election election were held, and as soon as the election uh, got over, the like corona case uh, start rising uh, raising up in our place. So like people are like complaining that at the time of election, COVID cases were like uh, there was no COVID cases, and now when the election are over, the COVID cases are rising. So like there is a um, what are you, there were questions raised on this why only in the means uh, uh, why in uh, when the government take any uh, uh, meetings or uh, like uh, big gatherings then the corona disappear and at the time when people start living normal life uh, again the corona comes so there is a conversation going on between the like uh, peoples and now like is to, uh, most exams are held in this time because like class 10 and class 12 are giving their final examinations. So like uh, as the corona cases are rising, so people are facing a lot of problems because students have to go to the uh, in, uh, institution to give their exams. And now the government is uh, like, uh, you have to give your exam online. And some are saying, no, you have to give the exam offline and even if the corona case rises how will the student go and they give their exam so like there are a lot of conversation issues going on regarding the covid cases and even the political uh, issues because like uh, even people uh, go out they they are having a risk and now like the government have a uh, put uh, put some uh, like rules and regulations that people have to wear masks in any cases, wherever they go, if they do not put the marks, uh, they have to pay a fine of like thousand rupees. And like uh, the all the shops should be shut down by eight, six uh, p.m. in the evening. And like uh, um, all the public gathering place, uh, uh, only 50% people can attend. And in a place where there are more than 300 plus cases, uh, so like government have cancel all the like uh, public gathering things. So like, 
like um, even like we can say there is a political issue with regard to corona or it is heavily rising so like a lot of conversation is going on between the public sometimes uh, when the media are go and ask the people who are not wearing masks why are you not wearing masks and then the uh, guy will reply because it's my way and when uh, like they they used to just reply when there was election there was no corona cases and now when the uh, election is uh, shut down uh, the in, uh, like the corona case is like rapidly increasing so like there have been issues going on regarding this but like uh, even like uh, now there is uh, people like uh, yeah, youth the youth are very concerned about the covid cases so they are uh, taking care of them uh, themselves and the people uh, around them so like uh, government uh, and like they have stopped supplying the vaccine to the other country right now because they are uh, supplying vaccine to the people uh, uh, in our uh, locality and like uh, i think uh, the older people who are above 45 they are uh, they are given the mass priority on the vaccine so uh, everything is going under situation but like even we have to take much and the government and the people itself have to take much care of uh, themselves okay so what i what i would like you to do i can't make you do this but it would be good for you to just keep note of all the things that are happening because it is a question of authoritarian government like is the government going to use this as a way to become more powerful or is the government really concerned about people and so then you have some people think this and some people think that and if you keep track of that instead of just saying it's a mess just keep track of this dynamic and see how it pans out, right? Because you'll learn from it. It's a good learning occasion. Was the government transparent? Did they, for example, did the politicians know before the election that actually it was spreading, but they didn't say anything because they wanted to have their rallies, right? And so yes, the election. Then, you know, they start, okay, so you need to say, you know, wonder if you can get any information about that. So there's transparency. Well, what if it turns out they did control the statistic? Is there any accountability? Will they lose an election next time? Will they get criticized for it? Is the public educated enough to know how to how to identify if the leaders really are acting on the basis of the best data or are they only acting in a way that'll get get them more votes and that happened in my country so it could certainly happen in any country it's not uh you know mr trump said whatever he had to say to get votes and it wasn't anything to do with with the facts um so What's the dynamic there between what this, if the citizens want to hear things that, you know, flatter them or if they want to hear denial, then the politicians will give that to them. But, you know, it's a very, it's a dynamic that can change really quickly also. So I'm hoping you can use the situation just to learn over the long run, right? Two years from now, what will I look back and have learned? Just so you keep note of what's going on. That's the main thing, keep note. At that time, this is what I knew, this is what other people knew, this is what people were saying. Then, three months later, right? And that that's a really good educational situation for you to be in, but you know, I can't. I can't control you, but I think if you want to educate yourself, you could figure out how to make this a really good learning experience. <laughs> and you as leaders are going to have to deal with a lot of things like this. So I think it's a good starting point for you. Um, Claire, do you have something? 
them. Yeah, I just had one thing to add. It's really just reiterating the points that have been made about George Floyd already. But I was reading about it today and just seeing posts about it on Instagram. And I saw one that said, this is accountability. Um, He's where we start and the whole system is next. And I think that that's a fair point because cops in situations like these have not been held accountable hardly ever honestly and um, this is definitely a good step in the right direction and I was proud to see it but there's a lot to be done um, following of course. Right so what I'm thinking uh, what I want to get across to you wherever you live that ultimately maybe after you're done with undergrad you sort of start at that place where this is where I think I could make the biggest difference, right? So in terms of racism in our country, one thing we really need are African-American kindergarten teachers. We absolutely need them because the African-American little boys coming to kindergarten need to feel really comfortable at school. And if they don't feel comfortable at school, and I, this is, I don't mean to stereotype, I just, my kids grew up in an inner city school. And again, they're already put at a disadvantage, right? This isn't necessarily because they misbehave. So my niece said to her mother when she was five, six years old, she said, the black boys get blamed uh, easier than the white girls. Like a kindergartner can figure it out, right? So. <laughs> So, you know, somebody would say, I'm going to work on racism by being an African-American kindergarten teacher, right? Somebody else decides I'm going to work on housing. Somebody else, I'm going to work on the legal system. Somebody else, you know, and you can only do one thing or one thing at a time. And that's not idealism. That's just realism. Because if all anybody cares about is money, the system is going to blow up or power or whatever. The system will collapse and you'll get authoritarianism. That's realism. If you have everybody trying to find some one thing that they can spend their life working on, that's not idealism. That's the only way to have stability and to have at least as good a society, maybe better moving forward. That's realism. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is the jury members. And I don't know how the rest of you, how your legal systems work. But in our system, if you're going to, uh, in a criminal case, the person is guilty only if it's um, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. So it means that there could be some doubt that he's guilty, but not it's not a reasonable doubt. I mean, there's, you know, I doubt you're a human being or I doubt, you know, for George Floyd, you know, was it the drugs in his body? Was it his heart or was it the knee on the neck? And so um, the jury members were people who had not heard about the case or they didn't have an opinion. <laughs> so they were out to lunch. They were not people that think about politics. So they're, you know, you never know what they're going to think when they finally have to think about facts and inferences, guilt and innocence. The, you shouldn't have citizens like that. That's what Al was saying. You should be thinking about these issues like Socrates, well, actually we haven't read Socrates yet. Socrates said we should be constantly examining each other. We should be thinking about the, the votes in the assembly, even if we're not on the assembly. We should be thinking about the votes in the jury, even if we're not on it, because just talking about it is the way we get educated. So. It is a, a terrible thing when the public, wherever you live, is not engaged 
even in their thought processes, right? They don't talk to each other about the political things. Um, and that's just like, it's a mental exercise, just like physical exercise, right? If you don't exercise, your muscles are just gonna rot. If you don't think about politics, you're going to not be a good citizen, right? You're gonna be a drag, you're gonna be unaware and politicians can take advantage of you if you're apathetic or if you overreact because you hadn't thought about what was going on around you. Another thing that's important is that um, on the defense case, defending the policeman, the police officers union has a number of uh, people that it pays to be witnesses for the defense. And they have degrees. This one guy had a degree as a pulmonologist or something, right? Some professional degree. And he got up there, he was paid by the police unions. And the defense lawyer said, well, do you think it could have been the drugs in his body? Yes, it could have been. Do you think his heart was, yes, you know? And so that was the goal, was to plant in one jury member the claim that there was a reasonable doubt. That's the goal. That guy gets paid, I'm sure, a lot of money to plant the seed that there's reasonable doubt. And then it will be a hung jury. He won't be declared guilty if there was one jury member. And these jury members don't think about political things at all. <laughs> and so they, you know, they come into this totally blind, not having practiced. So this should not be the case. This is where Athens was set up so that people, when you do get on a jury, you have thought a lot about other cases. You've thought about what a reasonable doubt means, when there is, when there isn't, you know, You've thought a lot about just in general about being a jury member, even if you hadn't thought about the particular case. But anyway, everybody was super worried about it because that was, you know, that was what could happen. That one guy could have planted in the, the mind of one juror that, the, oh, that's a reasonable doubt. <laughs> and that would have been it. So the thing that also bothers me is how so many black men get accused of murder. Like, why is it beyond a reasonable doubt if you're black? <laughs> and that's a big issue where jury members might honestly think that they're sort of deliberating, but that's where you have implicit bias. And so, you know, somebody would think it's reasonable. Um, or, you know, there's, there's no reasonable doubt. Like a black guy might get up for murder and there'd be other, you know, the evidence back and forth would be a lot more, you know, difficult to siphon through. And if you know if it was a white person, they'd say uh, not beyond a reasonable doubt. But if it's a black person, it is without them necessarily even realizing that their deliberative process is biased. And again, that's where if you talk about the stuff just day in and day out, it's just something you're aware of, then you become more conscious, more self-consciously aware as a citizen. Um, there's another, again, policing is difficult. And if police officers feel like they've got PTSD and they're, they're overreacting, they should get, you know, six months off or, you know, get an office job and then also have counselors if there's a mental Ill, illness case to have professionals in other fields come. So there's, or to have the police officers have to live in the neighborhoods with the, these are their neighbors. Or at eight o'clock every morning when the police officer comes on the shift, he meets with community leaders they say there's a strange guy in the neighborhood or they say this teenager is just going south. Um, so 
you know, watch out, don't overreact. You know, it's just sort of keeping people informed. So the police officers, they live in the suburbs. They don't know any of these people. They, you know, there's high crime area. And so they, they start out afraid. Um, there's a breakdown in trust and goodwill, which again is the foundation for a good society. Um, the one other point was that police officers also can figure out what they have to do. So the woman who killed the, the woman police officer who killed the guy in Brooklyn Park said, and it, you know, it was on the microphone, taser, 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 and then she shot him with her gun. And, you know, the taser is on one side and the gun's on the other side and they have, you know, the gun is much heavier, they look different. But she knew if she says taser, 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 and then she pleads, you know, not guilty, you can never prove that she intended to kill him, right? So it's beyond a reasonable doubt. You can prove that she didn't, that she intended it, even when she said taser, taser, right? So, you know, if you've been in the job long enough, I'm sure you can figure out how to say things, do things that would lead juries, even if they thought you were guilty, that they couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt because there was something you did to plant that seed of reasonable doubt. So, so I'm just giving you an example of how complicated these things are, just so you know, first of all, you should think about the political stuff in your country and it's complicated and you shouldn't quit thinking about it just because it's complicated. And if you, if you write stuff down and over time you teach yourself, right? Say, I can't come to an opinion about this. It's too complicated. Well, that's great. Just write it down and maybe you revisit it or maybe something happens later on and it reminds you of that. That's, that's how you educate yourself, that's all. Um, so that's how you become an educated citizen, I think. Um, all right, who else do we have? Poppy, do you have something? Is there anybody else who has something that they want to say? Okay, so I, I will talk about Athens then. Um, all right. So, okay. How do I have? Uh, I have like half an hour. All right. Okay, so here you go. Um, My name is Plato, and my name actually is a nickname. It's, um, there was a kind of tree in Greece that had this really huge, broad leaf. And so uh, the nickname Plato either means fat so, <laughs> you're fat, or it means that you have really broad shoulders. Uh, and nobody quite figured out, you know, what my nickname meant, but that's okay. I'm not telling. Um, but I have to tell you the story of my life because it's important. And I figured out as I watched my society fall apart, I figured out that I happened to live through something that is an archetype. It's a pattern. So in our society, we had myths and we learned all those myths about the Olympian gods. We had tragedies. I went to the tragedies. That was part of our culture. I went to Delphi. I knew all this stuff. And um, as I was coming of age, uh, my country went through this huge shift and so I want to explain this, how my country 
had a wonderful democracy and then it corrupted it and it lost it. And my uncle Solon was the, the founding father of Athens and the constitution and citizen self-government. And my other uncle Critias became the tyrant. And it just broke my heart, right? It was just awful. So I decided I would start a school and I would educate future leaders. So, um, so the best and brightest, the aristocratic uh, young men from all the other city states would come and from Athens. So they had government, some of them were monarchies, some of them were aristocracies. There was just a small elite class that took turns ruling and being ruled. And some of them, and then in Athens, there was this democracy. But what I told them is I, we, I wrote these dialogues and they talked, the dialogue show how we destroyed our city state. And I was trying to tell my students, you have power, but if you abuse it, you will lose it. You will create instability in your society you will probably have an uprising against you or you'll have to become more authoritarian and there's more instability. And if you, if you abuse your power, your children are gonna suffer for it, even if you don't. So don't pretend that you can be unjust and get away with it. <laughs> That's my message. Everybody suffers when people with power abuse it. So, but first I wanna tell you what I loved about my city state because I don't like to be ethnocentric, right? I don't, I don't have the attitude, my city state right or wrong, you know? <laughs> oh no, I just feel like I was really lucky. I just happened to luck into getting born into Athens and to having my family be leaders, right? Aristocrats. We, we were the privileged class, but that meant that we passed down this legacy of we could maintain this democracy because we were from the elite that did have the power to do that. So I just feel like I had this tremendous luck in terms of how I was born. So here's what Athens had that I loved so much. Um, so it starts out with the, at this level, at the ground level is the realm of biology. This is the house, right? Where your family, so these are family relationships. They enable you to survive. The focus is on the household. You get your basic needs met, but you should always uh, live moderately, middle class, right? If you want a democracy, you have to have a middle class. So that's down here on this level. And then you have the village, the marketplace where people go to exchange their goods. And then you had the theater and then you have the temple to Athena at the top of the Acropolis, which is uh, out, out, cropping of rock. And so when you go from your home, you walk, you go to the theater. So the symbolism is the theater is on the way to the Acropolis and the temple to justice, Athena. And over here is a court of law. So first you have to flush out all those irrational desires. So you go to the tragedy, you're reminded of all those irrational ways you could behave and you go, nope, nope, don't wanna do that, flush it out. Now I'm ready to walk up the steps and worry about justice. The other thing that Athens had, the temple to Athena, the roof of the temple follows the line of the hills. And that's because human beings need cities in order to be completely human. So they're just fitting in to nature according to their nature. So their nature is to build cities, but cities are not 
transcendent. They shouldn't destroy nature, just like Delphi, right? They're not destroying nature, they're completing nature. So now we have to protect the natural world through the use of our reason. But we always have to integrate nature and culture. Um, okay. There's the temple. Now, we, um, in some religions, I don't, again, all I know is about medieval Christianity. But in medieval Christianity, the view is that everybody is trying to get to heaven. And so you behave yourself, you control your desires so you can get a reward after you die. And the churches are built right on the ground in the muddy, noisy, dirty, wicked world. And you step into that church and it's like a rocket ship to heaven. <laughs> it's quiet. You have chanting, you have incense, you have the light coming from, you're just supposed to get your mind out of this world. That is not Greece. In Greece, you walk slowly up the steps. The steps are, are deep, but they're not very high. Each step isn't that high. So you're not thinking about getting up the next step. You're thinking about your mind going from Bio biological association, your material needs, up to your cultural needs, your need to understand good and evil, justice and injustice. So it's a slow walk. So you get to the top. This is citizen consciousness. This is a higher level of consciousness, but it's natural and it's necessary in order for you to be fully human. Also, we have a natural response to beauty and proportionality. And so the columns were created so that they actually are out of proportion, but they look like they're in proportion to a person because we wanted to imitate nature. So nature is symmetrical, ordered, proportionate. We respond to that order. We have a positive response to it. Because the reason why we're successful at flourishing is because we recognize patterns. So we recognize that order in the natural world. And so that keeps reinforcing, we get more and more pleasure from it. So the architecture is proportionate to follow that natural pleasure that we have. Um, here's the uh, courthouse, the rule of law. So this is where the gods, Athena, gave us the powers and expects us to use these powers to govern ourselves. So we are following what the gods want. We're doing our sacred duty to the gods by governing ourselves and each other. Um, here's the theater. This is where we go to flush out. We have to admit to all those dark desires that could take, take you over. And it's a warning, don't do this. Um, so, and that's right on the side. So when you're up at Athena, looking down, you can see the theater reminding you, if you're up here, you flushed all that stuff out. If you're on the way up, again, you're reminded. Um, then there's the Olympic Stadium. We already talked about that right? A sound mind and a sound body. Um, that the Olympics had uh, people came together, they formed a body of laws, they had judges to apply the laws, they had punishments, that just like a democracy, right? And so the Olympic Stadium is right there, there is one right in Athens, and they hold um, the, they hold some athletic contests there. And um, it's all about a sound mind in a sound body. And it's about people coming together, being able to be objective, being able to be rational, being able to recognize excellence, to pursue excellence, not to favor one city state over another. Here's the temple to Hephaestus. 
If you remember, he's the god of the forge and he was married to Aphrodite. And when they were together, everything was made stylistically, the colors, the shapes, the proportions, the city was planned. Um, we were imitating nature, right? The city completes nature. Um, but then Aphrodite would run away with Ares and they'd start a war. <laughs> but this is Hephaestus, the temple to Hephaestus. And this temple overlooks the marketplace. So the marketplace is where people come from um, the rural areas on the weekend or they come from the city. They buy all their goods that they need for basic needs, right? They buy their utensils and their food and their clothing. But they also, right next to the marketplace of things, is a marketplace for people to, of ideas, okay? So the assembly, we had an assembly of citizens. And if any of the leaders wanted to go to war or wanted to make any decisions, major decisions, it would come before the assembly and the people would vote on it. Um, the assembly members, you had to be male and Greek and have a certain amount of land. Then your name was put into a hopper and it was totally chosen by lot. It was arbitrary. That's so that the aristocrats didn't have an advantage, right? And it was a much broader base for who gets to govern. And it's governed by a majority of citizens, whatever, however they vote. So um, when at the marketplace, in the assembly, before uh, there has to be this council of leaders that decide what issues get voted on in the assembly. Because of course, something, you know, there could be this plan for A, B, C, D, but then all of a sudden the city gets invaded, you know, all of a sudden there has to be an emergency meeting and another decision gets made. So there has to be a council that sort of gets that stuff in place. So the council meets here and they posted what was going to be voted on that week, right, in the assembly. And so the citizens from the rural areas, the urban areas, they all came and they got informed. This is like the media center. And then there was a place where the jury members who were picked by lot that lived out in the rural area would stay in the apartments there in the agora. And Right there was posted what jury trials were being, um, what the jury trials were going on. And again, that's public information. Everything is transparent. Um, and then there was a space deliberately made, just a clear space. This is where the citizens are supposed to go and talk about it, right? Not only do you get this little list of information, you find out, well, what are the two sides to the issue? What's the debate going on? And they had these three tiny little temples to Zeus, Athena, and Ares, of course. The goddess of wisdom and justice, the god of justice, and the god of war, because you guys, the citizens are gonna decide about war, and that's a very serious decision. Don't go to war too quickly, like Ares. He was too willing to go fight. And Athena keeps him in check. You know, only just wars, only for the right reason, only in the right way. So those three temples are sitting there and you're supposed to go talk about the latest issues of the day. And so I just think personally, I am always amazed. Like I've been to Athens I think 19 times, but it always takes my breath away how absolutely forward looking this was, right? How amazing the way they organized it. Um, this is the temple to Poseidon. It's down at the end of the peninsula. I don't know if you know that. But anyway, he, over, he was the god of the sea, you know that. And he's looking at 
two different seas, the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea sort of come, come together at the end of Athens. Um, here's uh, Zeus. So we had um, our myths. Some of our myths were really about psychology, but some of them claim to be about the causes of natural things. So there's a story about Zeus that he had the thunderbolts, right? So that's a case where the myth and the science conflict. There's a lot of other myths are about psychology that are very insightful, but then there's some of them about natural forces. Okay, then at the islands, there were a number of uh, speculative thinkers who, who assumed that the gods were not the cause of natural events that there is an underlying ordering principle to the natural world. So there is a pattern in the natural world, in the universe, and they speculated about what that ultimate principle was. And one of them, one group was called the Democritians, and they, they posited this thing called an atom. And, an, and the reason why things look different is because these tiny little atoms, the word atom means the smallest thing, they're shaped differently. And so then they come together in different ways. Now today, we, all, we also have physicists or speculative thinkers who are the same kind of thinker because they keep trying to find the smallest particle. So there's the alpha particle, the beta particle, the um, quarks and neurons and whatever, neutrinos, whatever. So that those would be the people who are starting, want to find the smallest thing and see how everything builds from that. Well, that was Democritus. Then there was another one that said earth, air, fire, and water, and they have attraction and repulsion, Empedocles. And again, that's recycling, right? <laughs> that everything, the overall amount of mass energy is the same. It just goes from one form to another through this, you know, attraction and repulsion, actually energy, right? Then there was one, Heraclitus, he thought fire was the um, basic principle because it's constant energy, it's constantly active, it's constantly acting on something. Um, and he said, the only thing that doesn't change is the law of change. And so everything, all the material things are constantly changing, but um, the law of change is the only thing that doesn't change. So he was a relativist, right? Everything's always changing. He said, you don't step in the same river twice. Well, because it has different water in it, you know? <laughs> so then you have to ask yourself, oh, is that true? It's not the same river because it doesn't have the same water. But anyway, I could go on and on, but it was that's that was their thing, just to speculate on those natural principles. Um, then there was, we had the first island off of the port of Athens was a center for women's health. We had really high quality healthcare because we valued reason so much. And we had lots of medicines and lots of therapies but we even had one just for women's health. So women would come there with menstruation issues, menopause issues, pregnancy issues, right? Um, birth, all the, okay, then that's a beautiful site. So, so people would sit around and talk about beauty, truth, goodness. What is beauty? What is truth? What is goodness? And, and um, that was what made Athens great. Everybody's talking about citizenship, justice, beauty, <laughs> and um, I loved it. So um, let's see, there's Corinth, I'm not gonna, and we've already talked about Delphi, so I don't need to talk about Delphi. Um, the notion of health, mental, physical, and um, spiritual health. So Hygieia, this is, her name is Hygieia, it means health, obviously. Now I have to tell you how we corrupted it, which makes me so sad. <laughs> we were fighting against the Persians, who 
who are actually, you know, where the Persians are. Some of you are Persians. Um, and they had a, a king who was like a demigod. And he dressed up to look like superhuman. At least this is the stereotype the Greeks had about him, which might probably isn't true, but whatever. And he got carried around in the public square and everybody just worships him. Okay, so, and I, I'm sure this is a stereotype, don't worry. <laughs> Those of you who are Persian, uh, this was what the Greeks said about you. And I, I know that that couldn't all be true. Anyway, so, um, so the Greeks thought the Persians were barbarians, right? They don't try to cultivate citizenship. They don't provide opportunities. They don't give citizens choices in how they want to live. They don't have an assembly. They don't, you know, they don't do any of these wonderful cultured things. So the Greeks thought they were just by nature a better culture because they cultivate the capacities of the citizens. Whereas the Persians just have this one guy makes all the decisions, everybody else is just the, you know, an idiot. They're not supposed to know anything, just obey. So we beat them and we had this huge flourishing. Well, two of the city-states were the most powerful, Athens and Sparta. Sparta was the military state and they sent all their young men to military school. My country, right or wrong, you fight in battle. That's how you prove yourself. The city honors people who fight in battle, that's it. They don't have poetry, they don't have international trade, they don't, you know, they don't have foreigners coming in. There's no immigration, no emigration. 80 year olds make all the rules. Um, you're a soldier, you're a general, maybe you then are a political leader, but it's a closed society, um, blind patriotism. So those city-states did not like each other. And so they started to develop animosity. And then they started to be afraid that they were going to, you know, the other one was going to get them. So they forced all the other city-states to take sides. And so they developed these power blocks. And um, so Untari in Indonesia, um, the president of Indonesia, I can't remember, it's the first one, the founding father, I can't remember Sukarno or Suharto, but he, he had a meeting of what was called the third world countries because these were countries that did not want to have to take sides in the Cold War, right? Between Russia, China, and the US. And so this was exactly what happened in uh, Greece. These other city states, we don't want to get involved, but he forced them to get involved. So the story of Melos is the story of a city-state that tried to stand up to Athens and got abused. So, um, oh, I only have five minutes left, but I will, okay, I'll try to go back and I'll show you how we corrupted our city-state. So everything that sounded so good also had a dark side to it, just like, <laughs> and we should know that because all the mythological gods, they all had their sacred passion and then they had their dark side. So Athens had its sacred passion democracy and then it had its dark side. So guess what? How did they pay for all these wonderful monuments to democracy? The, the way they paid was they created these power blocks and then they, they charged, they taxed all their allies a whole lot, right? So the allies were, were paying them all this money to defend, you know, the, the power block, but they were using it to build these monuments to democracy. And meanwhile, those other city states were having a much harder time setting up a democracy because they had no money. And then also the spoils of war. So when they, you know, one against the city state, they take the money. You should never do that. 
because then you're going to fight wars for the sake of money. So if you want a democracy, you should never use the spoils of war uh, as part of, you know, creating allegiance to your city state, because then you're going to, um, yeah, you're going to declare more wars for money. Um, okay, and so what happened with Athena? The citizens' ideas of justice started to get corrupted. Um, what happened with, yeah, the, the, the court of law? So foreigners came in and taught the best and the brightest young people rhetoric, how to be persuasive. So if they wanted power, they're going to have to persuade the assembly to do what they want and to persuade the jury. And so the system was corrupted. So jurors expected to be flattered. They expected to be manipulated. People in the assembly expected it. And if you were honest, you got in trouble. They wanted to be um, corrupted, <laughs> but they thought it's freedom. You know, he's free to hire whoever he wants to be his son's teacher. The teacher's free to do whatever he wants. I'm free to decide whatever I want in the jury assembly, whatever I feel, right? They weren't learning practical wisdom. At the tragedy, people were not learning the lessons. They thought it was coaching, right? They thought the poets wanted them to imitate these characters rather than to purge themselves, right? So you want to be like Zeus. You want to be able to have sex with all these young, pretty girls. No, <laughs> the Olympics got corrupted because most people were couch potatoes and then the athletes were over-specialized. I talked about that before. Temple to Hephaestus. Now Hephaestus is using all of his skills to make swords and shields instead of to make um, beautiful city. Um, at the Agora, the discussions among people were becoming more and more corrupt, right? The people were motivated by the wrong things. And so they would, they would talk about public affairs in ways that were corrupt. Their judgment was corrupted. Um, and so eventually, oh yeah, and then they got threatened. Um, they wanted, they got less stable. So they wanted everyone to believe in the traditional gods. And so then they demonized all those, those atheists out there who think that the natural world is self-sustaining and is the gods. And so these guys are living out on islands so they don't get killed. And then there's all that abuse of women. So a lot of women who came were probably came because of abuse, not just because the health system was so wonderful. Um, so what happened to this dialogue? Um, and this is where later on we'll talk about Socrates. He comes there and talks to people. He was, yeah. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll talk about Socrates later, but this is the thing about Athens. What I think is you use Athens or you use this history of Greek philosophy as an archetype, right? This is how a society can cultivate democratic norms, citizen engagement, and this is how it can lose it. And every country can sort of compare themselves uh, to this, this model. So that's the way I teach it. Um, anyway, so are there any questions? I guess about five people either left or they lost their internet. I don't know. But... Um, so that's what we'll talk about for the next, for um, the rest of the class, for both of you. The US people will, after the AUW are done, the US people will read the symposium. But, but Athenian democracy, and, and then for those of you who aren't American, just comparing your country because, you know, learning how to think about how these issues are true everywhere. That's what I'd like you to do. Okay, um, I hope to hear from you and I will see you next, you know, five days from now and I'll wait.
if anybody wants to talk to me. Goodbye. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, I should stop the recording. <laughs>